This is episode 60 of Let Us Interrupt You here on July 9th, 2022 on a Saturday. Uh, episode 60 was supposed to be on on Tuesday. Unfortunately, we were all tired from uh, the 4th of July. All in all, Mike could not join me tonight. Unfortunately, he tried to get out of work early and he just got caught up in work and was just too late. It was never going to work out uh, for him to come here tonight. Um, unfortunately, it is just me. There is no other co-host to fill in for me. Uh, we got a lot to, to discuss, a lot to um, talk about right now, including tonight, wh where I <laughs> did not forget. Well, I almost did forget about this, really. Uh, Keith Hernandez uh, getting his jersey retired as of right now, tonight with the New York Mets, as they're taking out the Miami Marlins tonight. Um, I believe I, I, I believe the game already had began at this point around – Actually, it began earlier. Actually, it began actually earlier today. Today, it began at four o'clock today. He was all emotional about getting his jersey retired because this was in the works now for about six months because they announced this before they officially announced his, uh, the schedule being released that he would have his jersey retired. Um, Keith Hernandez, I will say this, was one of the was what was a really good, good baseball player. He wasn't he wasn't like great, you know. Uh, you know, he had some, he had his moments, he had his MVP moments. Uh, this is a man right now who I think deservedly so is in a, is in a hall of fame class conversation. Now, I don't know if he's a, I don't know if he's a first ballot hall of famer as far as, you know, where his, now, I don't even know if he is in the hall of fame because I believe he, he um, I'm not even sure if he would be in the Hall of Fame right now at this point. I don't have that information in front of me. I, I, I'm assuming that he, he either already has it in the Hall of Fame or was in consideration for it. Uh, but this, this man was an all-star MVP, a league MVP at least three three or four different times. Uh, all-star MVP uh, within the within the 70, late 70s into the mid-80s. Uh, he started his career with the St. Louis Cardinals back in 1974. Also played for the New York Mets. And uh, one season with the uh, Cleveland Indians back in 1990, although I guess you could say now the Cleveland Guardians now at this point, but, you know, because they completely erased the uh, Indian uh, translation right now from the website they were on right now, which I still can't believe they did that. But uh, he got his jersey uh, retired tonight, today. Right now they're currently uh, in a tie ball game right now in the eighth inning against the Miami Marlins. It was all emotion. I mean, this is a man that's played over 2,000 games in his career. He's had at least over 8,000 plate appearances. Um, 7,300 at-bats. He has scored, went around the bases 1,124 times. He's had 2,182 hits. He's got 426 doubles. Or actually, is that? That's right, yeah, 426 doubles, 60 triples, 162 home runs. Not really a big number there for a guy who's been in the league for 17 years. But he's got over at least over 1,000 RBIs, 1,000 walks. A thousand strikeouts, which isn't really a good thing you want to hear. His best uh, batting average was at uh, 284. His on base percentage was 384. His slugging percentage was 436. And his on plate percentage was eight. This guy was a consistent hitter, not a consistent home run hitter, not a, like a big flashy power hitter kind of guy, type of guy. He's not, you're not going to see him get Barry Bond stats right now, but he was a great player. I mean, he contributed a lot in his t time with the, with the, um, Really, I would say mainly his time. He's probably more remembered as a New York Mets. People might have already forgotten that he was a, a St. Louis Cardinal. I mean, if you're well aware that he was a St. Louis Cardinal, good for you. Uh, I was one of those people that, that knew he started his career off with St. Louis Cardinals. I did watch some videos of him in his time in St. Louis. They weren't really flashy, uh, flash dash until the late 70s, right around 79 into the 80s, really. Uh, but yeah, uh, again, Keith Hernandez, again, congrat congratulations on getting your jersey retired tonight. I was planning on going to the game. Unfortunately, I couldn't get any time off for it. I actually got rejected uh, the first time around, actually, when I actually tried asking him for off. Because apparently I had too many days off even from work, even though I never get any days off from work. I'm lucky to even have the time when I get home from work. I've been working 10 hours. It's not easy. It's not easy doing that. But uh, but for Keith Hernandez, again, congratulations right now on a really uh, really spontaneous career. Um just you're, you're considered one of the best in my opinion, you know, I mean, you know, sure. You're not a big home run hitter, but you're a consistent hitter at best. You're a guy that's always on the plate, always a threat, not a home run threat, but a threat to on base by any way, shape or form, whether you're walking, whether you're getting a single, a double, triple, whatever it's you're, you're that kind you're, you're that threat, 
You know, you're you're the guy that, that no one no one would want to go up against. And he had a great career. He really did have a great career. I mean, this is a guy that had at least five All Star MVP appearances. I mean, he he's had regular season MVPs. I mean, this man part of the '86 World Series Mets, which I actually just realized now he was part of that team. Uh, played over 150. He played over 149 games that season. He got 90 walked 94 times in that season. He had 13 home runs that year, 83 uh, or 83 RBIs. This Met team, what well, that Met team was incredible. So he did, so he did win a World Series with the Mets. So I was wrong. So I was wrong. I actually forgot he's part of that uh, World Series team. Now that I think back on it, now, uh, anyway, but my mistake. Again, congratulations to Keith Hernandez. And you know, if he's not already in the Hall of Fame, which I believe that he's not, I'm not quite sure if he already is in the Hall of Fame now at this point. Anyways, I don't believe that he is. I may do a Google quick Google search on that right now. Oh, just disappeared on me for a minute there. And you got a guy right now who's been, who really went to school and uh, college of San Met, Met Mayo, graduated Cappuccino High School, uh, Terra Nova High School. He actually went to two different high schools, actually. I think he graduated from Terra Nova, I believe. I think he started out in Terra Nova, then to Cappuccino High School later on. Um. I might as well just ask this on Google right now. Is Keith Hernandez a Hall of Famer? The St. Louis Cardinals also inducted him. According to Call to the Pen, 17 with a ceremony in July, the St. Louis Cardinals also inducted Hernandez into the Cardinals Hall of Fame. So he's not in the official uh, Cooperstown Hall of Fame. Actually, he's in two Hall of Fame. He's not in the National Baseball Hall of Fame, but he's in the two Hall of Fames with the Cardinals and the Mets. So that's – I didn't think he was. I would have remembered him being inducted at that point. But um, anyway, congratulations. That was my uh, Google thing on my uh, computer who had, who had asked the question. Uh, but anyway, uh, moving on. So as we as I keep moving forward here, we got the uh, news stories of the week right now. Joey Chestnut. Uh, competing in the uh, international hot dog event that they do every year on Fourth of July, uh, he had a broken—I think he had a broken foot, or he heard, I heard it was a tore Achilles tendon, a broken foot. And it was probably a combination of the two. Uh, he managed to eat sixty-three hot dogs, and despite eating those sixty-three hot dogs, he ran into a—I uh, don't know—one of those animal uh, life support people. I guess I guess they said save the dogs, whatever, save the hot dogs. And I just and I thought this was funny because he, you know, it was like it was it was like anti like animal like like save the dogs whatever kind of thing. I just thought it was interesting, really, that this actually happened. So it was a it was a it was a protester and like an animal cruelty protester, I guess that 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 somehow uh, hopped the barrier. I guess this is during the uh, the event, and Chestnut just tackled him along with the other guy that was, I think it was one of the judges. That uh, tackled him and uh, stomped the mud hole in it before he was able to finish his hot dogs and win the event. This guy was able to do this with a with a possibly a tore Achilles tendon on crutches, eating sixty three hot dogs. This guy's this guy's the goat as far as I'm concerned. This guy's the goat. I wasn't going to even talk about this on my podcast, but it was the biggest story all week in sports. As far as like crazy moments that happened all week long in, in that type of sports world, when you have a, a, an animal protester who somehow jumps on stage. Luckily, he didn't attack anybody. I mean, he was stupid enough to come on stage with a Darth Vader mask on to then basically get the jump on Chestnut or just get some publicity for the for like 15 seconds before Chestnut just stuffed a mud hole in his ass. I would love to see if Stone Cold Steve Austin would have gone on that stage and hit the Stone Cold stunner on him. That would be a hell of a story right there for the week right there for um, – that event, but that was a fun event. I, I, I got to be honest right now. I've always been intrigued by that event. I've always wanted to go to those events live and see it live in person to see those people eat like 63 hot dogs. And I can tell you right now, if, if I were to enter that contest, I'd probably tell you right now, I'd probably eat at least 15 to 20 hot dogs if I was lucky, maybe even 23. I would say 23. 13 to 23 is kind of like my lucky number. So I got to go with one of those two numbers if I were to enter those events which I don't have uh, time to enter those events. I, I should make time, though. These are the days to remember. 
And that will probably be the most memorable Nathan hot dog, uh, hot dog eating contest of all time. Sim- sim- simply because not just because of the amount, like, cause the amount of hot dogs is one thing, but to stop a, like a woke protester from coming on stage and just to get the jump on him. It's incredible. It's in, it's insanity. It really is. And guts on Joey chestnut for, uh, uh, basically uh, making sure that no one else got attacked either. That he took that guy down real quick. I, it was like it was mid pause. So like well, he was eating the hot dog mid like midway. Looked over. He gave like the Tony Soprano like I'm gonna kill you look, and basically took him down and stepped him out of all on him. That was uh, that was crazy. Note to self: When Joey Chestnut's eating hot dogs, don't get in his personal space and don't don't do something stupid on stage next to him. Because he will jump you. Ted Williams, the legendary uh, baseball Hall of Famer, uh, Red Sox play, a former Red Sox player, celebrating the 36th anniversary this week. It was happened. I think it was on Tuesday. It was his 20th anniversary. I think it was his. Uh, t- I, I believe it was 20 years since he retired. I believe from baseball, or not 20 years. It was 30 years. I think 36 years he retired from baseball, and they were celebrating it the other day in uh, Fenway. I may be wrong on the anniversary day, but Ted Williams has been out of baseball now for a while. And he's one of those legendary, you know, Red Sox players that you're never, ever going to forget. And people still talk about to this day. Even people in my generation talk about Ted Williams in his career, what he meant to baseball. He meant a lot to baseball. I mean, I, I mean I'll give you the career stats right now for, for a guy who's been around for baseball since the 1960s. And this guy's been playing baseball from – 1939 into 1960. So you could argue right now, which I don't know why they even call this the 36 year anniversary, but I think he played 19 seasons with the, all with the Red Sox. It says here he played 20 years with the Red Sox on here. 21, 22. So I guess this would be his, I don't know. I, I heard it was 25th anniversary, 26th anniversary. I guess of honoring him, I guess. I had to be longer than that. It's got to be at least a longer anniversary. But let me give you his career stats right now at this point for what he did for baseball. He played in 2,292 baseball games. He had 9,792 plate appearances, 777,706 at bats. He's ran around the bases almost 1,800 times. He's had 2,654 hits. uh, 525 doubles, 71 triples, and 521 uh, home runs, and uh, 1,839 RBIs. This guy is a multiple-time All-Star MVP. I mean, there's not even a doubt about that in my mind. He was an All-Star MVP repeat, 1953 to 1960. He was also an MVP from 1946 to 19, I believe it's 51. He was a league MVP in 1939. That year, he had over Bad average of 327. He had 31 home runs and 145 RBIs. He had 159 RBIs back in 1949, 10 years later, after he made his debut. I'm I'm a little distracted. I just got caught off by the, um, I don't know what that was. I heard a bell outside. I don't know if it's an ice cream truck driving by my house or what. Uh, But anyway, uh, Ted Williams also had 162 RBIs in 47, 156 in 46 going backwards here. He had 162 and 49, 126 and 48, 144 and uh, 51, and 136 RBIs in 54. Definitely for sure already in the Hall of Fame. Now, for a guy who never won a World Series, this guy is surely in the Hall of Fame. I believe he is in the Red Sox Hall of Fame. If I'm not mistaken here right now. He definitely has been at this point, as far as I know, now, you know, my memory doesn't serve me correctly because I usually remember these things on the fly. So I will take a look right now to see if whether or not if he is in the Hall of Fame, and he is. He was inducted in 1966. He passed away on July 5th of 2002. So I, I do remember him passing away that year. Uh, but anyway, he was a, I mean, if you want to consider the guy who, I believe was, you know, I would say Barry Bonds might have well been almost the next Ted Williams. The difference was, was that he took steroids. Ted Williams, I don't believe was ever a steroid user. 
Uh, Barry Bonds, I think, try to live up to his image, try to get, uh, try to live up to his name, try to shatter every record he possibly could. He tried to be, he could become the next Hank Aaron, possibly Ted Williams, Willie Mays, you name it. But the difference was that Bonds was a steroid user. Williams wasn't. At least I don't believe he was. But they were, but his anniversary was this past week. I believe it was a. It was a 20-year anniversary for his death when he passed away. So that was on July 5th. So I apologize. I I, I don't know what that third. I don't know what that 25 anniversary thing was that popped in my internet this morning. So I will fix that. So it's been 20 years of celebrating the life of Ted Williams. So I apologize if, if that description is wrong. I'm actually going to fix that later on in the week. But sticking sticking with baseball for just a second, the uh, Red Sox um, are currently playing right now against the Yankees, and the first two games so far have been terrible. I mean, you you heard my thought. I think I gave a thought on the Tampa Bay series. Uh, the first two series, they were outscored so far by a grand total of eighteen to ten, and it was not pretty. I mean, it was it was pretty bad. Um. So yeah, that was a really uh, bad, pitiful performance. And let me just put this in perspective. And I already said this. I think I may have said it during the uh, sound off of the uh, Tampa Bay Braves series. If the Red Sox lose this series to the Yankees in a sweep, their season's done. There's no coming back from that. You got Toronto and, and Tampa Bay are, are, are going to start to get hot in the second half of the year. You got Jeff, you got Bogarts who's checked out. You got JD Martinez who's checked out. Chris Sale can't come back and rehab fast enough, although he's being rushed to when he's at 100%. The rest of your starting rotation is pathetic. You got Evaldi, who's injury prone. You got Garrett Whitlock, who you still don't know whether or not he's your closer. You now know that Tana Hawk is your closer, but he's not vaccinated. This is a complete disaster. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry for that sneeze there. But a complete disaster. You're, 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 as far as your farm system, go, farm system goes, it doesn't exist. Chime Bloom is gotta be the, by far in the like as far as general managers go, and there are a lot of bad ones. He's gotta be at least the third or fourth worst right now in the majors today. And this team's really about four or five games above five hundred. Well, currently six right now. It'll be five later on when they lose tonight to the Yankees. Because I, like I said, the Yankees are gonna sweep them. I mean, the only credible pitcher that's playing to, in this series is Pavetta, and he's not pitching until tomorrow night. He's eight and six. He's probably been your second or third best pitcher behind Whitlock and um, Evaldi. Actually, no, I'm sorry, Waka, not not Evaldi. Although Evaldi, you could argue right now is probably fourth in that conversation. That that's how bad the rest of the rotation is. And Evaldi's been out for about almost two or three months up to this point. That's pretty bad when you have no credible starting pitching. And this kid Cutter Crawford tonight. I'm sorry, but I, I, he's not suiting me well. He's not suiting me well. Th this Red Sox team, as far as I'm concerned, is a complete embarrassment. A complete embarrassment to the league. And, you know, this Red Sox team, for where they were last year to where they are now, it's just embarrassing. And Shine Bloom is one of these people that will – run these people into the ground. And then when they want that contract that they so desire for, he takes it right away from them and trades them somewhere else. And I just don't get that system. It's like the Bill Belichick system in New England. It's like, take a pay cut, we'll keep playing. Take a pay cut, keep playing. Take a pay cut, keep playing. It's all about stocking money for themselves. Bill Belichick thinks about himself before the team in New England. Giant Bloom thinks about himself before the team in Boston. So does John Henry. And this is what you have right now at this point. At least the Patriots can actually tell you that they're a dynasty team. They've won championships by doing it this way. Can you say that about the Red Sox? Not really. What? How many championships have we won lately by doing this? You've done nothing. And in fact, you didn't start this complete sham of bull crap until really the pandemic here. And you could argue at that point, it was a crap out year. You, you, you basically suspended Alex Corp for an entire season. That technically never even fired him in the first place. And you crapped the bed. You could have cared less about that entire season. And then when you actually gave a damn, 
You signed Kyle Schwarber in 2021, and your team had a chance. It was one, probably one or two games away from going to the World Series, and you failed. You failed miserably. And now tonight, <laughs> I might give you the score. I might as well just give you the scores right now for some of the games that already happened tonight. I might as well just give you the scores right now. Right now, they are scoreless right now. They're in the second inning right now. <coughs> Excuse me. But so far, let me give you the scores because this will wrap up right around my standings here in just a second. So Giants, Padres, they're on right now. That's a one nothing game. Marlins, Mets right now in the bottom of the ninth. That's a tie 3-3. Rays and Reds are tied 3-3 in the bottom of the ninth with two outs in Cincy. White Sox beat the Tigers 8 nothing. Phillies beat the Cardinals 1-zip. Orioles beat the Angels 1-zip. Rangers beat the Twins today 9-7. Athletics beat the Astros 3-2. Guardians beat the Royals 13 to 1. Diamondbacks beat the Rockies 9 to 2. Pirates beat the Brewers 4 to 3. Braves beat the Nationals 4 to 3. And Blue Jays, Mariners, and Cubs, Dodgers play later on tonight. So let me get you the standings right now at this point and see how this panned out at this point. Because Tampa Bay was in fourth place literally, I think, six days ago. Was in fourth place. They have leapfrogged Toronto and Boston to get back into second place. That's what they've done. You've been completely embarrassing at home. Your home record is 21 and 20. You're one game above 500. You're 24 and 19 on the road. And you know what you are against the American East so far this season up to this point? You're 9 and 20 against the American League East. And guess what? You have not won a single game in those series matchups. You haven't beaten Baltimore in a series. You haven't beaten Toronto in a series. You haven't beaten Tampa Bay in a series. And you haven't beaten the Yankees in a series. And right now, you're already down 0-2. And right now, there's not a start. There, there, there's not even a – that bullpen can't even save you either. Your bullpen's a cancer. I hate to say it. You have no bullpen. You have really a, a depleted starting roster. You have no first baseman, unless you're going to keep using Cordero the rest, of the, the rest of the season. He's just as useless. He couldn't even catch a pop ball the other night. That allowed that game to go – although there were turn events that led to that, other than Jackie Bradley Jr. misplaying the outfield there. That was in the uh, sixth inning, I believe. And last night with Verdugo, who didn't know where the ball or who didn't even know where the ball was last night, putting his arms up in the air saying, "Where's the ball? It's like fifty feet away from you out in right field, near Pepsi, Pepsi, what, past Pepsi pole." I don't know what to tell you there. If I'm the Red Sox right now at this point, it, 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 and I'm looking at it from this perspective here, I'm just going to tell I, I'm, I'm going to get Shine Bloom his pink slip at the end of the season because this this is not going to work out. Because you have now proven that having no – and this is – you know, and people are going to make the argument, oh, Dave Dombrowski didn't get a, a closer or a first baseman. Actually, you did have a first baseman at one point. You did. You got rid of him. Thanks to Giant Bloom. And let's not forget about this for a minute. Yes, you had no closer. But that's because you're under the false pretenses right now that your offense could have delivered. In reality, you have Mookie Bet and, and instead of just dealing with the stuff off season. It was an on the, on during the season at like outburst all year. You had your issues with Mookie Betts arguing about the contract. You got Xander Bogarts saying he's going to leave now the Red Sox now in twenty twenty two. It's the same thing. It's Mookie Betts all over again. And you wonder what ended up happening? You end up trading him away instead of giving him the contract he deserves. And to me, that's kind of pathetic. If you ask me, it's actually kind of pathetic. And now you're going to do the exact same thing again with Xander Bogarts. You're going to probably do the exact same thing with Verdugo, and you're going to get another lousy outfield who can't produce out in the outfield. And Jackie Bradley Jr., who is good. He's a good outfielder. He's got some gold gloves to prove it. But I just look at him and I say to myself, he's not the best hitter. He's not the best guy to put on base in situations. He's just not. There's not really any power home run hitters. The only people that are really doing it for you right now is Story and Devers. That's it. And so far, they haven't produced in fact, the other night, Devers was the only one who was hitting home runs for you. He had two home runs and five RBIs on Thursday night. Almost came back and won the game for you. Came up short. Right now, you have a lot of grand slam and a three-run shot by Josh Donaldson in two straight days. You got Judge who's hitting home runs off of you. It's just it's just an embarrassing season so far. Just an embarrassing and, – and you are at a point right now where you really just came off of sweeping off the Cleveland Guardians – who look like a proven team that could make a playoff run. They could be. They're 41 and 41 right now. They're above 500. They may surpass Toronto. They may surpass Boston. They may surpass Tampa Bay for a top spot in the wild card and get three straight games at home. 
We don't know how this is going to go. Don't don't sleep sleep on Cleveland and don't sleep on the Chicago White Sox. They're 40 and 43. They're not out of it either. Seattle, not out of it either. They just took the first two games so far against the Toronto Blue Jays. I'm convinced right now they win three out of four. In fact, I'm pretty sure I think I had the Toronto Blue Jays and Mariners evening up or, or Seattle winning three out of four. I don't remember what I predicted in that in that uh, sound off about the uh, that other series. But you look at the rest of the I mean, in, in the major league, like in the NL East so far, the Braves who are not that far away from the Mets right now, they could surpass the Mets within the next like couple of weeks or so and get back first place. Even though they never had first place all year long, they would be in first place for the first time. But you know what I'm saying. Milwaukee's in first place. St. Louis is in second. They're not that far. They're heading in a downward spiral. Padres are 54 and 36. There are six games back from the Dodgers. They're 54 and 29. They, they've been on a freaking tear. Nine and one in their last 10 games. You know what the Red Sox have been in their last 10 games? Five and five. Actually, I'm sorry. Actually, I'm sorry. That was the uh, Tampa Bay uh, line there. That uh, they're really three and seven. And they've lost four straight games, and I believe they've lost six out of their last eight. I believe, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken. So they're not doing so great right now. And to top it all off, if you would have done the two most important things, and, and actually, and here's what I would have done, because I don't think first baseman was really that much of a factor anyway, because you could have, you just could have just kept Mookie Betts and that way you would have had a first baseman, J.D. Martinez. Or you could have had a first baseman, Kyle Schubert, and we could have just got rid of J.D. Martinez. Because J.D. Martinez is, is wasted, wasted space at this point. That's what he is. He's a waste of space. He's like Adrian Gonzalez at this point, past his prime. Waste of space. Why did we get him in 2012? Who knows? Or I'm sorry, 2011. Sorry. Who again? Who knows? But in my opinion here, you should have done this in 2019. Resign Mookie Betts. Give him the extension he deserves. Uh, give Bogarts another extension. Add more years onto his contract along with it. And get a freaking closer. You could have gotten uh, uh, freaking... Um, what was it that the, the, the who's now a closer now for the Braves now, right? That Jensen kid could have gotten him. Now I got to deal with Tanner Hawk right now. And you want to know my honest opinion? He sucks. I don't care if he got closer or not. He just freaking sucks. Matt Barnes sucks. Um, Hannah's Robles, who by the way got put out, who, who's, who's been released from the team sucked. And I took the Red Sox this long, long enough to realize, oh my God. I just realized this. He absolutely blows. I remember how he blew game five and six for us in the ALCS last, last year against the Houston Astros. Who would have thunked it? I'm just saying, like, th this is a pathetic Red Sox team this year. And I'm telling you right this right now, their losing streak continues. If they lose to the Yankees in four games, they're going to get swept against Tampa Bay as well. I'm convinced of it. They're not good enough. They're not good enough this year. And by the way, right now, to, add things, to make things worse, Tampa Bay right now just took the lead right now in, in tonight. It's now 4-3. to three. And Marlon's Mets are currently in the top of the 10th inning as well. So Keith Hernandez is actually in, in attendance watching this game right now, hoping the Mets will win and they get secure. Because the Mets, And this will be so New York Mets at this point. If they were to lose this game and Atlanta Braves would have taken first place by the day. Let's say the Atlanta Braves had the exact same record or a record below this. You know Atlanta would have taken first place by storm. And it's not over here because Miami, Miami still got another game on Sunday. They could just blow this series off, and Atlanta could take first place right before the All Star break. It could happen. It's so New York Mets. I, I'm not convinced that our lead is safe right now. I'm really not convinced it's safe at all. So, we'll see. By the way, I, I wanted to bring this up too because there's another reason why I wanted to bring up the rest of the baseball world because there was news today about Albert Pujols and Miguel Cabrera going to the All Star game per the commissioner. Oh, Ty's also in the All-Star game. Judge is in the All-Star game. Stanton's in the All-Star game. I believe Donaldson might be in the All-Star game as well, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I don't know who's in there as far as the pitching. I don't even know who the pitching matchup is going to be. It might be Otani to start off with. I don't know. I don't know who's who's on the opposing side, but we'll look into that later on. But here's why this is a mistake. Because Albert Pujols at this point, look, I get it. It's his last year. He wants to retire as a Cardinal. They're, they're doing it up for him this year. I get it. It, it. it means a lot. But when you are like really past your prime, and that's what Albert Pujols is, because Albert Pujols could have just stayed retired and not come out of retirement this year and then go play back for St. Louis and retire for them. You could have retired from him as it is and got a, a jersey retirement. Why, why are you playing this year 
for this team. I don't understand it. I don't get it. Right? Because right now, you want to know what he's batting at right now? 198. Why would I want somebody who's right now past their prime batting 198 in the All-Star game? Someone tell me that. Someone tell me that. Like, like, is it worth it? I mean, I get, you know, I get you're trying to connect with the with the generation that you're losing, but keep in mind, you got a lot of baseball fans right now who are just tuning out right now because of the wokeness of sports and the reality of the voting crap that was going on. And really, you got players who don't abide by the new ruling. Nothing has changed since the lockout. And now you expect everybody to go go along with this. And it's like, and, and you notice today how both teams got shut out today. Miguel Cabrera with the Tigers also got shut out today. You want to know what Miguel Cabrera is batting today? He's actually batting surprisingly at that 300. He actually deserves a somewhat of a spot in there. You know, I was actually going to crap him because I didn't even know what Cabrera's batting average was until I looked at it just now. But he went over three today. And the fact that he's batting at 300, it's actually kind of surprising. Not going to lie. I thought it would be the other way around. I thought Pools would be worse, but I guess he's not. I thought they, I actually thought Pools would be batting 198 and Cabrera would be batting 199. You got two old guys basically coming in here right now who are legendary in their careers. Don't get me wrong. They've had legendary careers playing baseball for their respective clubs. I just don't buy, I just don't understand why you're going to have a, have these two past prime players in an all-star game. Unless you're going to throw them a, a ball, one of those home run juiced up balls where they can just hit the crap out of it and there's nothing in the ball at all and it's easy for them to hit the home run. Fine. Do it for that special aspect. But then you're killing the All-Star game. You're killing the All-Star game by doing that. And that's not fair. That's not fair at all by any means. So I, I just feel like that you're just hurting at this point. You are absolutely hurting this whole thing. Anyway, so enough about that rant. I had, I, I had to let that off my chest. We have the NHL draft that happened as of Thursday. I'm not going to get through the entire list right now because it would be a lot to do digest in this whole thing. But I will give you the, the draft. There was 225 picks. I'll just give you the uh, the Bruins portion of it, really. But I'll give you the round one one. I'll, I'll, actually, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you the I'll give you uh, the top ones really. And you can, you can look at the rest of it on your own time on ESPN.com because run, round one through seven will be available for anybody who's a hockey fan out there. So the Canadians got Jerry Savoski, left wing. The Devils drafted second. They were they got Simon Demick, who's a, def, a defensive player. Coyotes got Logan Cooley, a center. Shane Wright, a uh, center for the Kraken. The Flyers got Cutter Gauthier, left wing. Columbus Blue Jacks got David Jarek, defensive player. Kevin Kororski got uh, drafted by the Chicago Blackhawks, another defensive player. Uh, Red Wings drafted Marco Casper at center. Sabres drafted uh, Matthew Savory at center. And also got a first African-American general manager this week in Mike Greer. So, again, congrats to Mike Greer for his uh, job as the, uh, as the um, first African-American general manager. A lot of respect there. You don't you don't hear that very often in hockey. I'm surprised that Greer was even interested in this because he was a forward player for the Buffalo Sabres, so go figure. Um, Anaheim Ducks got Pavel Minsk, uh, Minta Yuvonki. I can never say that last name right, a defensive player. Coyotes got uh, drafted again in 11th pick right now, so the Coyotes got two picks. The, uh, the uh, Coyotes got Connor Gecki, center. Uh, Blue Jackets got Denton... I can never pronounce this right. Denton Mark Mijic. Uh, Blackhawks got Frank Nazar, the center. Winnipeg Jacks uh, drafted right wing Rutger McGrody. Uh, Canucks got Jonathan Larankney. Sabres got the Noah Austin, the center. Predators got Joaquin Kamel, right wing. Dallas Stars drafted Leon Bruchel, defensive player. The Wild got Liam Ogreen, left wing. Capitals got, uh, of Washington, got Ivan Murasanskio. Uh, Pittsburgh Panthers got Owen Perick, uh, Pricky. Ducks got Nathan Gaucher, center. Um, St. Louis Blues got Jimmy uh, Sunegard, right wing. Uh, the Wild drafted again, Dan Danella Yorova, right wing. Blackhawks got uh, defensive player Sam Rizzle. Canadians got Flippy, Felipe Mazer, right wing. 
Felipe but Bistrid, the center is for the Sharks. Uh, Sabres got Jerry Kolick, the center. Uh, Coyotes got center Maverick Lamorick. Winnipeg Jazz drafted again another center and Brad Lambert. Lightning got Isaac Howard. And the Oilers got Reed Sheffer left wing. So let, there are two more left wings that got drafted in the uh, first round. Now the Bruins, I'm not, like I said, I'm not gonna get through, I'm not gonna go through all the rounds here. That'd be insane at this point. But I will, but I will pick out uh, some teams, and we'll just, you know, I'll, I'll try to dissect the, that, those picks that way. But the Bruins did get a pick here. I might as well even get get to the draft stock here, because I do have the Bruins information as far as where they drafted in this round. You can probably get their draft results actually, actually as of right here, as far as where they were drafted. I don't know why I'm not getting the uh, draft information. I think I might be able to pull it up on my uh, – let me see if I can pull up my Instagram here. I can probably – because I actually do have the roster information on here. But, I mean, like like I said, I'll say – like I said this, I'll, like I said before, I'll say it again here. It's, it's one of those scenarios where you think – it's all figured. I guess I don't have the thing saved on here. Huh. I don't have the I don't have the story on here. Interesting. I don't I don't have the uh I guess I can't do the uh Bruins report, but they drafted Matthew Porras, who was a center. Um uh, I can't get the information I want here, so I guess I have to scroll down this way, which would be a lot more difficult. But you know what? There's there is more draft information. The draft for the NHL is kind of exciting. It was in Montreal. It was a very exciting weekend for all the NHL teams out there, all thirty of them, thirty one of them. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was a really great weekend, one through seven. I obviously won't have time to. Uh, get the information I want to get from here. Unfortunately, it was kind of annoying at this point. I really thought I was going to actually going to get this going, but I guess not. That is kind of annoying though. I would normally get the uh, draft to me in this information slot here, but oh, well, oh, well, that's that. Uh, Katzen Rebuska, 18-year-old, uh, won the Women's Wimbledon title. Here's what the interesting thing is about this. I actually wanted to get into this and, and tell you why uh, this was actually very telling here, very interesting, and see how this actually played out here and why this actually was very telling here. This happened earlier today. This happened earlier today. Actually, as of this morning, at 11 o'clock this morning, this actually was very telling here. And she won her first slam, her first final here. It was, unex uh, it was as unexpected and unbelievable as Elena Rebesca had found her Wimbledon uh, championship. And to be in as super happy as she was about winning the Grand Slam title at age 23 and ranked 23rd. Think about that. 23 years old, wins the t was ranked 23rd and wins the ch championship. This is according to Howard uh, Fenwick here of the Associated Press. This was actually pretty amazing here. This was a pretty amazing final for her, for what she had to go through. She, you know, to face the second best player in the women's division for tennis and to take her down, it just, it's incredible. When you hear stuff like this, you don't, you don't, I don't really cover tennis very often here, really. So if I'm botching the names, I apologize. But it, it's pretty amazing right now. It's too bad Nadal had the knee, knee injury this year. That he could not finish the thing off right now. So Djokovic might win his uh, I believe his 20th major, I believe his 21st major for Wimbledon. So we'll find out later on this weekend. Uh this was the first what our first woman in women's final since 1962 between a pair of players both making a debut in the Grand Slam. So neither one of them uh has made a debut before in the Grand Slam. Uh Rebecca Nalging being nervous at the start when she stepped into the sunshine, filling the hundred year old stadium. Let me tell you something right now. The men tennis to me at this point is too predictable. The women's one, you just never know. You never know anymore. 
And honestly, with the names, they're always different names every year. And when you hear stuff like this with like underdogs like this, that's what makes sports so great. That's what makes sports absolutely incredibly great. And for again, congratulations to this girl. She absolutely deserves it. To win her first major like that at 23 years old and be ranked 23rd, ironically, it is kind of corny, but you, you got to love it. You got to love the moments like that. So, again, congratulations to her. Very sad weekend as far as deaths goes right now. This was the this was in the last, I would say, 24 to 48 hours. Uh, first of all, I'm actually going to start us off right now with um, James Kahn uh, here. I'm even saying the last name right. Uh, star of The Godfather, James Kahn, and also who was in the uh, TV series uh, Las Vegas, uh, passed away at the age of 82. He started. Uh, he played. He played. He was on the role uh, Sonny Corleone in the Mafia at, as the for the uh, Godfather, as well as a string of the key films in the 1970s. Uh, this is according to Andrew Pulver, who wrote the uh, the article for the Guardian. Notorious for a hell raising party lifestyle, con cut a sway through Hollywood in the 70s and 80s before abruptly quitting acting, for, and for what the actor described, a pretty scary period. This was during his uh, cocaine addiction. So he had an um, addiction at the time, which is why he was quitting acting for the time. Uh, when he, uh, uh, he came back in the film industry later on, though, to win awards in the late 80s, or he came back in the late 80s, but the elf and the other things. He was uh, one for a claim for films as Misery, The Yards, and Elf. Uh, Khan, was, uh, Khan really was born in 1940. In Bronx, in New York City, uh, he his first small role was in a Broadway production in 1961 of the uh, of Blood, Sweat, and Stanley Pole, a Second World War play by William Goldman and his brother James. Uh, after a string of minor film and TV appearances, Khan achieved a leading man status in 1965 in Howard Hanks' stock car racing drama Red Line 7000, following up a role alongside with John Wayne and Robert. Mitchum in Hawks in uh, 1966, Weston El Dorado. Uh, but, you know, he, he was remembered a lot for The Godfather, I think, honestly. And the Elf movie was good and all. I never liked the Elf movie personally. I, his acting was good. Don't get me wrong. He was the right fit for that role. But to me, it, it just, the chemistry to me just didn't make it fit to me. I mean, I think, I think when you got, um, when you really got, I'm see. This is what I mean about the, about James Conn here. Just, just it, it's it's so hard to believe that he passed away. It, it really is hard that he passed away here, and it, it it just it's almost it's almost like you want to cry because like he was a lot in the uh, entertainment industry, and it is kind of sad that that he had passed away. It just, just again, just it is kind of unbelievable at this point. But I just thought the Elf movie with Will Ferrell. Will Ferrell, I think, tried too hard in this film. I think he did try. It. I think he overdid it. That's why I got so annoyed with it at that point. You got people like him, John Farrar, Bob Newhart, uh, Mary Steenberg, Peter Dinklage, Zoe Deschanel. I mean, that, that was a, a wonderful cast. But I just never, I you know, you you. When you think about it, you, you just can't imagine that particular person in that film. But he was the lead guy for that role. This is a guy that, you know, this is a guy that really changed the um, entertainment industry. And, and I think really put a boost, really in, his, in, in more of a boost right now, more of a, of a, of a accomplishment. Because you, when you think of this, you never think of a, of a, a comedic fellow like James Conn. You think of a, a serious business type type of film. Because he's more in serious general. Like you're never gonna find you're never gonna think of him in comedy. You're just never gonna think about anything like that. Uh, but again, very uh sad and condolences to him, friends, colleagues, and his family. Um on his very sad day. Very, very sad day as far as that goes. Also uh the news of uh Paulie, uh, Paulie Walnuts, as he was called in The Sopranos, Tony Sirocco had uh, passed away, had died last, or actually died yesterday at age 79 years old. This is how the, this is how the um, 
really, this is how he really got his start. He was born in New York City in 1942. He found himself um, in trouble with the law as a young person. He uh, turned his attention to uh, the entertainment business, the show business, after an acting show visit uh, in jail. His first on-screen appearance came as an extra in the 1974 film Crazy Joe. Uh, he's been in for decades now. He found steady work as a character actor and mafia roles. He frequently worked with Woody Allen, appearing in films like Bullets, Over Broadway, Mighty Aphrodite, Everyone Says I Love You, Deconstructing Harry, Cafe Society, and Wonder Wheel. But nothing will compare to his performances and absolute tremendous acting that he had done in the surprise with James Cavaldi and um, just the rest, just the rest of that crew. Um, with Eddie Falco, Michael Imperoli, Lauren, Lorraine Bracco, uh, Robert Ill, Iller. I might be able to get the rest of the cast on here as well. Uh, Jimmy Lynn Sigler, Steve Sharippa. I mean, there were a lot of people on the cast right now. And, of course, Stephen Van Zandt as Silvio Dante. Uh, just the, the the cast that was on The Sopranos, the the, the, the teamwork, the chemistry was just perfect right there. And, and every time I saw him on TV, I, I, I laughed because I just – I never, lev- never thought to myself, like, like this guy's not funny because he is funny. He can he plays a role perfectly. Like you, you, you when you look at him, you think of a guy who's a mafia guy who busts balls. That's exactly who, what he was. And you know, for a guy who got in trouble with the law, I mean, you, if, if you would have said right now this guy was in trouble with the law, it's like, yeah, of course he would be, because he fits that role perfectly. He 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 has that trouble making mindset, you know, and he brought that into the into the TV world. And he was the right fit for the Sopranos. And I think really, honestly, a lot of people really forgot the other roles he was in. Uh, but if it really wasn't for that crazy Joe f- film, who knows if he would have been on the Sopranos, who knows if he would have done any other acting, you know, if it wasn't for the Sopranos given the opportunity for all those years from 19, it was like 1999 on to 2007, who knows what he would have done, you know? I mean, he could have been in other films. I mean, I think there's no doubt about that. He could have worked with Elijah Robert Nero, uh, Steve Sharippa, uh, you know, just, just a, it could have worked with David Chase again and other things as well. Could have worked with a lot of people. I mean, but there, you know, surprise was around for, for six seasons from 99 to 2007. And man, when, when, and just think about it now, the two main people, or I would say that there's only one main person left from that Soprano cast. The two, like the three main ones that really caught your attention. And now both of them have passed away. The only one that's left right now is Steve Van Zett. Thankfully, he's still with uh, Bruce Springsteen and his band. So I don't know. We'll see. Well, you know, again, condolences to, to family, friends, and colleagues for Tony Soroka right now, who passed away at 79 years old. It's, it's still hard to believe that he passed away. Um, the, uh, morning, uh, the morning show that's, uh, that, that's on eight, uh, that's on Apple TV, uh, the camera assistant, Eric Gunner, uh, Mornstein, uh, suddenly died following a motorcycle crash. He was 39 years old. This actually happened on Monday. Supposedly the news broke out as of yesterday that he had passed away. He was going uh, 70. Uh, he was he, the accident happened on Highway 74 in California, which is under investigation, according to Highway Patrol. So condolences to, to them and their family. And uh, one more thing: uh, former 49er quarterback passing away at age 43. That was quarterback uh, Jimmy Williams, who passed away at 43 years of age right now. Started his college career at Vanderbilt as a running back. Eventually switched over to quarterback. In 01, he was selected by the Buffalo Bills in the sixth round in the draft. However, he never played a down for the franchise. Instead, Williams handed uh, a four-year stint with the 49ers during that span. He had 88 total tackles, six passes defended, and an interception. Additionally, he had 576 punt return yards and a touchdown. So not really a memorable career. 
Uh, he ended up signing with the Seattle Seahawks later on. Uh, he spent two years with the team before joining the Houston Texans in 2008. And uh, that's it. As far as what his career would have gone at that point, uh, not really much of a memorable career. It was just eh, eh career. But very sad for that young man to uh, pass away. I could always go out there, friends and family for that one. So that's <laughs> just so many deaths that have happened over the week. I mean, it's actually insane when you think about it, really, who's, who's passed away over the last few weeks, really over the, over the last two or three years. It's hard to believe. But, um, yeah, as of right now, yeah, that's it. Uh, Damian Lillard getting a two-year, $122 million extension to stay with the Trailblazers just a little bit longer because it would just add on an extra two years. He would have been, been gone in 2024, but he will be gone between 2026 and 2027 uh, NBA season. So Lillard just signed himself up to be miserable for the for another five years is what he basically has done. Uh, this was a mistake, in my opinion. I don't know what they were thinking with this. It made no sense. Uh, to me, I thought this was bizarre, I think. And just surprising out of the blue. I mean, you talk about really – it, like really putting a reach out there for you actually thinking that you, this is going to work for your time in Portland. It's not going to work. I mean, I don't know what else to say here besides this, but it's not going to work. <laughs> you know, Portland is at this point without your combination with McCollum. I mean, unless Gary Payton is going to be your shooting guard here and be a starter for your team. I don't see how this works. You could be an eight seed. You could be a 7C. I just don't see it. I don't see it. I don't see Damian Lillard the next five or six years advancing out of the first round with what they have right now for a roster. Unless they get something big to happen. I don't know. It's kind of scary to think about, really. But, yeah, Lillard got an extension. Harden took a pay cut, I believe. This was – um. I think I, – I don't know if I mentioned this. On, I don't think I ever did mention this. But James Harden took a pay cut. He was – Signing back with the Philadelphia 76ers, he declined a 40, uh, I think it was like $47.6 million deal. I think it was. He took an extra, he took a $50 million pay, I think a $50 million pay cut to stay with the 76ers now for a while. I guess really what it really comes down to is that this, I think it was just bad reporting because it said he accepted the offer, then he declined the offer. In reality, the team declined it because for one thing, he wasn't worth the money. Harden took a pay cut. That's just the way it is. Um, He just, is declining and it's like it's not like the guy's gonna get any better in philadelphia he's just a waste of philadelphia right now he's wasting philadelphia's time if you ask me uh he got progressively worse by coming to philadelphia i hate to say it but he did um he was clutch in certain moments but it wasn't like he was the sole reason why they got to the second round it just i don't buy that for one minute i think even if james Harden wasn't on that team they would have gone to the second or probably even possibly the final round to face the celtics really um but yeah uh, still no news, no news yet on Kevin Durant on his future with the Brooklyn Nets and whether or not he wants to be traded to Boston. I still think the trade still happens. I'm still on the hype behind this, but I was on the fence and whether or not it'd be either Jalen Brown or Jason Tatum. I was on the fence about that. I had no idea. Uh, other than, other than what was happening right now at this point, I don't know how far this is going to go with him as far as. As far as planning goes at this point, I'm not sure what's going to end up happening, but, you know, we'll see. We'll see what happens. But uh, apparently he was going – he went off during the NBA Finals. So this is what the story was this week. It was talked about throughout the week on, on Zolak and Bertrand and Felger and Maz on 98.5. Uh, I think this is, you know, during the NBA Finals. He was reminiscing on his night that he was drafted. Uh, how he was disrespected by the fans, how the fans basically booed him. And, they, and he was booed out of the building when he uh, was drafted by the Celtics. Uh, and this was actually before, I think this is before game, t it was said, supposedly it was before game two. Um, I think this was a bullet quote, I guess, from Jason Tatum, I, 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 or Jason Brown, sorry, not Jason Tatum. I can just pull up the quote here. This may be the wrong quote too, but uh, he was he was talking about you know he was never really appreciated. I'm not gonna go quote by quote, word by word, what they say here. I'm just gonna paraphrase it here. But he was never really appreciated in Boston. 
uh, the p- people were telling he was being asked around by the coaching staff and media, like what he improved. He's like, I, nothing's changed here. I've just been doing the same thing, playing the same way. And he was basically talking about how he's just disrespected by the uh, Celtic organization. Now he took that to heart, you know, very sensitive. I mean, it's like, here's my opinion on this whole thing. And at this point, would I be upset if Jalen Brown at this point was traded as out of, out of the uh, Boston Celtics? No, it's not because I don't like the guy. But you're not going to lose a number one guy in Jason Tatum. Tatum is your number one guy. I mean, as, as bad as I, I don't want that to happen, and I don't want that to be a thing in reality, I just think to myself, there's there's no chance. You know, and it just – and I and I think realistically, it's just – it's one of these things where – I think back on it before and I thought to myself, Tatum is too much of a risk to lose. And I think realistically right, right now that Brown has to be the one that, that give up Tatum. doesn't matter if you give up Brown. But if I had to choose, I'd say give up Brown. I know I was on the fence about it now for a while, but you know what? Brown is the guy that needs to go. This drama, this whole thing of, oh, no one loves me. You know, I, I look at it like this. He may as well have the person I have Kanye West at this point, except he doesn't need any meds to control his uh, issues of everyone that needs to love him at this point. He, you know, I've always been about shutting up your haters here. I think the haters have gotten to his head and he can't shut them up. And I think in his mind, if he gets straight out of Boston right now, he's not shutting up his haters at this point. But for him to go on record saying right now, like how no one ever appreciated him and all that stuff right now, that's a bunch of BS. It is, you know, and I, and I, and I, and I don't know if it was a shot directly at Brad Stevens. If it was a shot directly at Danny Ainge at the time, who was a former GM for the Celtics, but you want my honest opinion? Danny Ainge checked out before Brown and Tan were ever drafted to the Celtics. That's my opinion. Um, he never made any improvements. He never really had a plan set in mind. Wick Grosbachek overruled him on everything at this point. It was never an equal collaboration about anything. Um, and Brad Stevens, as far as I'm concerned right now, does his own thing. Wick just goes back, back and relies on Tatum and Brown of just to figure it out. He doesn't really do much as president besides go on Felger and Mass and do the interviews once in a while. He doesn't do an interview every week. Uh, Angel doesn't interview every week. Um, and there's been a lot of team presidents and team owners that have done – weekly interviews, whether it's the Phoenix Suns that do it, whether it's the Detroit Pistons that do it, whether it's the Cleveland Cavaliers that do it, they've done weekly interviews. I have never heard a weekly interview from Wick Grosbachek. I just never heard it. I hear once in a while, maybe, but I, I don't know if Grosbachek thinks he's just too special here. If he doesn't need the media at this point. If he doesn't need the admiration of doing interviews at this point. I don't know. I think he just thinks he, he's just that self-absorbed. And maybe that's why he's playing right now are self-absorbed like Tame and Brown. And maybe that's what him in the NBA finals. Because if you want my honest opinion, Durant's in his own mind, too. Sometimes that's a, that's a risk, too. But he's matured to get out of his own way, though. That's the difference. He was never in his own way during an NBA Finals run. He wasn't. I don't think he quit on the Brooklyn Nets. I think the Brooklyn Nets quit on him. That's the difference. Kyrie quit on him. Uh, that whole organization quit on him. The coaching staff quit on him. He did most of the work just to get that team back into the playoffs, I think, along with Kyrie. Although Kyrie did some of the work, really. Uh, Kyrie just showed up to make his stats look good, to say that he's still the best. He, he didn't really – let me put it to you this way. When Russell Westbrook did it in 2016 to get those triple doubles, he was trying to make history for himself. He didn't give a damn about the team. It was pretty obvious he didn't. And like Kyrie Irving here, didn't give a damn about the team as much as Durant tried. And Durant did try in that series, in that game four. But – from this, from this perspective here, here's my opinion. I think Jalen Brown would be a great trade deal. He'd be a good, he'd be a good person to uh, trade away in this in this thing with a package. I think you take and if you wanted, if I and I thought about the, the perfect package right here. You get four first round picks out of it if you're Brooklyn. You get um, Brown. You get Grant Williams, and honestly, you get Marcus Smart. You know, it's a risk to lose at this point, but I think Marcus Smart now, for the way he was playing defense all year long, he skyrocketed his value more than anybody else. He's more of a sky value right now than Jalen Brown is. 
And that's saying a lot because Brown's more of a number two. Smart's really more of a number three. Um, he was never really a number one. So I don't know who's been putting that crap in his ear. Maybe it was maybe it was uh, with Gross Machuk when he gave him that uh, four-year, $75 million extension maybe last year. I don't know. I don't know how bright that was. But, um, but yeah, realistically here, if I had to put my money on it right now, I would say uh, Grant Williams, Jalen Brown, and Marcus Smart might end up being traded for Kevin Durant. Now, as far as who you get back in return with Durant that comes along with it, I'll give you. I'll give you. The, I'll give it to you right now. I think Kevin Durant comes back here. I think somehow, in some way, shape, or form, we're going to see Russell. I mean, and I know this pains a lot of people to say this right now, but that but Damian Lillard's not going to leave Portland. He's just not going to do it. I thought it was going to happen, but here's my opinion: If this guy could come back and play with a distracted. Um, James Harden, who kept going to nightclubs, strip clubs in, in Brooklyn, New York during a playoff run, during a freaking pandemic, of all things. And a guy who was sleeping around with girls, bringing girls in who had COVID and infecting half his team, which they were, which Harden was doing that too. Harden was bringing in strippers. Harden was bringing in girlfriends and all that. that, that that's one thing. Then he, can, then he can deal with Russell Westbrook. Because I got to be honest right now about Russell Westbrook. I mean, at this point, I don't know how good he is defensively, but Durant might get better defensively. But I think Russell Westbrook, I think, or in this case, I, honestly, I, the more I even think about it right now, the more it sounds insane. But Durant and Westbrook and Tatum to me sound like a good tandem. It does. I don't know if it's going to win you a championship. I think Durant on his own could do it on his own here. Um it's just I, you know, I think of James Harden maybe, but at the same time, I just don't see it happening. I don't see James Harden being a Celtic now anymore. Now that he signed a two-year extension now, and re and giving himself basically a huge pay cut, that's not easy to do. Uh, to me, I think Russell Westbrook, and I said this before, he's a delusional player, but Durant could fix him, and that's really the only person that could fix him. Really, there's not there's not one single. I think he, with a combination of Ime Adoka and Kevin Durant could fix. Uh, Russell Westbrook. And, you know, this could add up to Kevin Durant and LeBron James feud. That's what that could do. And it could add more to the Celtics rivalry. It could add more to LeBron James hating the Celtics because he's gone on record saying how he hates the Boston Celtics. And you know what? It, it, it makes sense here. On paper here, it makes sense for an NBA Finals matchup if that were to happen. So who knows? If it happens, it happens. It doesn't. It doesn't. I mean... To me, I never thought I'd ever say this, but I, I just thought of this just now because I thought to myself here, well, it's Russell Westbrook and Kevin Durant. But here's the question right now. What do you get back in return at this point if you're the Lake, if you're the Lakers at this point? Because you got Tatum, you got Grant Williams, but you know what else? Are the, are the Lakers just giving up that and in a, in a three first-rounders as well to the South? To really, because that's another thing too, because you're going to get draft picks out of this whole thing. If you're the Celtics at this point, so you're going to get draft picks in return because you're already losing first round draft picks and you're going to get more back with Russell Westbrook. So I don't know if Russell Westbrook will get, will get his game better. I think he just had a horrible year. I think the pressure was on him because LeBron James was sitting out and AD was sitting out and it was just too much for him to handle. The market was just too big for him in LA. Now Boston's even a bigger market, even a bigger, bigger sports town. There's a lot huge in LA is there's no doubt about that in my mind. I think the pressure would get to them there, but Durant would be one of those guys that just quits on him and just lets Russell Westbrook run the show and set out for a game. He's not going to do that like LeBron would. LeBron would do that. Durant wouldn't. So I think Russell, I think Russell Westbrook here makes a lot of sense here as point guard runs. As far as defensive player goes, Westbrook can make some defensive plays happen. I got to be honest. I mean, he could, he could force some turnovers, I think. For a guy who made a lot of turnovers, I mean – over the and, and, and I think he ended up leading in turnovers, I believe, anyway. So it makes sense here, right? So you know, we'll we'll see what happens now with that going forward. But if you get Russell Westbrook in a trade here, which you know might be a, a slap to the face to the Celtics and the Lakers, and you want to know something, it, it's really a slap to the face of Russell Westbrook too. But the question is right now is is that. Do the Lakers pay that $47 million going to Boston or does Boston pay the rest of that $47 million? 
Because right now, if the Celtics end up paying that $47, $50 million contract with Durant's contract on top of all of that, it ain't going to work. It ain't going to work. Russell Westbrook, Westbrook has to take a pay cut, just like Jacob, Jimmy Garoppolo has to pay, take a pay cut in order to get traded from the 49ers. Which leads me right into my next story here right now, which is Baker Mayfield uh, was traded on, I believe it was Wednesday. Uh, I was going to do it on my emergency, emergency uh, sound off thing, but I decided to hold off for Saturday because the because the trade wasn't that big of a deal. What well, the Browns got back in return was a fifth round conditional pick. But Baker Mayfield is now going to be a starting quarterback right now in any in the NFC South with the Carolina Panthers taking on Tom Brady, Jameis Winston, and Desmond Ritter or Marcus Mariota every Sunday going forward. And here's my thoughts. I like the trade. I think the Panthers make themselves more of a qualable playoff team. I think they are a playoff team with Baker Mayfield on this team. Um, as far as I'm concerned, if McCaffrey stays healthy, then the Panthers are going to be great to watch. Christian McCaffrey not playing preseason, smart here. You want to you you know what I would do right now if I'm, if I'm the Carolina Panthers? Don't play Baker Mayfield during the preseason. Don't play any of your starters during the preseason. Set them all out. That's the best thing you can do right now because all these players are at risk at injury. They are all injured prone. I know it. That's the reality. Be very, be very intriguing this year to see Luke Keekley call these games this year in the broadcast booth, knowing that of the players that he knows and knowing the history he has with Baker Mayfield. There's some history there. So they played against each other before, so this wouldn't be – a first, I don't believe, for them. So, you know, and look, I mean, it, it gets in my calling games that involve Sam Darnold or Will Greer or Cam Newton because I don't think Cam, because I don't think Luke Keekley takes too kindly of Cam Newton shenanigans. I think he would completely bury Cam Newton if he was still on this team. I don't, I don't even believe Cam Newton is even on this team anymore. I think he might be still a free agent. But Cam Newton, as far as his career, where his career goes from here, it's over. It's over. The guy's got no chance of playing in the NFL ever again. He made a pretty bad. Uh, he made a pretty bad decision by playing quarterback midway through the season, after not even having to throw a ball all season long, barely did anything in training camp, not working out, and he sucked. He sucked for that Panther team. So you get rid of the suck. You get rid of that negative energy in Cam Newton, and you bring in Baker Mayfield, who I don't think is that is is negative. I think honestly he just had a bad season. You know the tour labor room didn't help. He was playing with it, and it was hard for him to play football with it. It was not easy. And now he's going to play with a team now at this point that really could be at, at injury risk at any time, whether it's the offensive side of the ball or defensive side of the ball. And, and the way I see it here, don't play your ones. Don't play your ones the entire preseason. Let people wait. Let people wait. Let people take note of this whole thing. Don't play your stars at all in the entire preseason. And I got to be honest with you right now, I think there's going to be a lot of teams that do that. Winston's going to do that for the Saints. Brady's going to do that with the Buccaneers. And in this case here, it's going to be Baker Mayfield that does that now for um, Carolina. Now, I only bring this up because of Jimmy Garoppolo. And the question right now is whether or not he'll get traded. And in my opinion right now, I, on that, I can tell you right now with, with full confidence that Jimmy G will get traded. But I'm going to tell you this right now. You know, as far as the, the July thing goes, it ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen in July. It ain't going to happen in August. And I'm going to tell you this right now. I think his pay cut happens right before week one, after preseason is already over. And he'll be on a trade deadline block. Within the next, I would I I would say here at the end of the season, I think Jimmy G's chance of getting trade right now is out the window. You had multiple opportunities to trade this guy away. Garoppolo has had multiple. He, he refuses to take the pay cut. In my opinion, they're just going to release him at the end of the year. It wouldn't make sense to release him now in the middle of training camp. It wouldn't make sense at the training camp. It wouldn't make sense at the preseason. It just wouldn't make any sense. I call it stupid if you ask me if they do it that way. I call it stupid. And as far as Garoppolo goes, here's the way I look at it. If Garoppolo gets released and no one's taking on that contract, 
he might just retire. And, you know, a lot of people are going to look at it and they're going to go, man, this guy's going to retire? That's crazy. But I think would say realistically the one thing that, that, that could use a quarterback right now realistically, because I think Carson Wentz is not going to work out. And here's my opinion. I think Carson Wentz's contract is good as dead. Once he gets, once he uh, gets to uh, <laughs> really, once he gets to start for Washington, that one starts going to kill his whole contract right there. And then plus it's Dan Snyder. I mean, can you really trust Dan Snyder? Washington could be a really good thing that could really use him. Washington could actually use a quarterback right now in that, in that division. Garoppolo and Dak Prescott every weekend. That'd be interesting to watch. I pay money to see that. Or or Garoppolo versus uh, Jalen Hurts again. Another thing I would watch on TV. Another thing that'd be worth watching on paper. It, it's like a pay-per-view matchup in the NFC East. Because at this point, I think it's so hush hush tone. But Garoppolo, as far as I'm concerned, if he gets released at the end of the year and then has to um has that $25 million thing on the table right now and nobody takes it, I think Garoppolo just retires. I think he does. As extreme as that sounds. I just can't picture Jimmy Garoppolo with no takers with that contract just sitting there and nothing happens. I just can't see it happening. I can't see Jimmy Garoppolo playing the NFL. I can see him retiring with us. Now it sounds crazy. It sounds delusional. It sounds stupid, but I think Garoppolo's time in the NFL is good as dead at this point. If no one takes him now, the only ticket at this point is Washington. You could say Cleveland, but I I think Cleveland would rather really would rather start Jacoby Brissett. <laughs> I think they would. I mean, I think they would rather take in two hundred thirty million dollars because they're just a dumb franchise than get a quarterback that is willing to take it. Like it, it just you know what I'm saying. It just they'd rather do dumb things. They're a dumb organization. They're not smart at all. And really, if I'm if, if I'm them, and I'm just being realistic here, I would just take. This in consideration. I would trade away right now if on Chicago. Make a trade right now with Chicago. Jimmy Garoppolo right now in Chicago for Justin Fields. There's a team right now that could use a Cornell quarterback because Fields right now ain't the future of that franchise. And the Bears' offensive line is still terrible, but the Foyers ain't that better. The Bears, who knows? If their offensive line improves, it improves. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But you got to take that risk at this point. And Justin Fields, honestly, point it would be extreme at this point for Fields to get trade. But here's how I would do the trade at this point for Chicago. If they were not, because I don't think this team is serious about Justin Fields. I got to be honest, I don't think they are. I don't think their coach is that serious about him. But here's my opinion. I would say Fields in a trade for Garoppolo here. Garoppolo gets moved over. And as a third team involved here, you you get back uh, definitely a first rounder in return. There's no question. But the team that takes Justin Fields, in my opinion, is Atlanta. And I know what people are thinking, oh, yeah, they got this Ritter in a trap. Yeah, they got him in the fourth round. He's got no chance of starting in this league. Look at Malik Willis. Drives in the third round, they still got Ryan Tannehill. Justin Fields, in my opinion, has something to prove in Atlanta. Atlanta could be a really good team for him to, to pick up the uh, slack in. And who knows? You you really have a, an elite wide receiver in Calvin really the following year coming back. Do you really want him to play for a team right now that, with the quarterbacks of, like, of the likes of Marcus Mariota and Desmond Ritter at this point and Felipe Franks? No. I wouldn't really want that to happen. And Matt Ryan, it, it, or, or, it could be that or, or Matt Ryan. Matt Ryan right now could be, and we're, and we're talking about Matt Ryan possibly, you know, retiring and trying to pull a Drew Brees coming out of retirement, but staying retired. You know, it's one of those things. Who knows? Because Indy right now has Matt Ryan, but for how long? You could add Indy to the mix as well once Matt Ryan retires. You get Garoppolo in a trade here. You send Justin Fields to either Atlanta or Indy. Either you send Fields now to Atlanta right now to play with the Falcons in 2022, or that's it. But Desmond Ritter is not going to make it in this league because Desmond Ritter is not a guy who's going to throw the ball 30 times and run the ball 30 times or run the ball 10 times for like 100 yards like Lamar Jackson would or seven times like a Michael Vick would. I just don't see that in him. He's not that good. 
Ritter, I think, honestly, has had the most easiest time in his career playing college football. Lamar Jackson didn't. He had a tough conference to compete with. It was not easy. That ACC was tough. Justin Fields in the Big Ten, like I said, tough. It was tough competing in, in the likes of those college football championship games. Not easy. But I can see a trade where Garoppolo ends up going to Chicago, Field goes to Atlanta. You get some first-round capital out of this whole thing if you're San Francisco at this point. Trey Lance completely flops the bed here. Then you might get Arch Manning in 2023 or 2025. There's a lot of draft capital here with this whole thing. And if Lance disappoints, then you just cut him within the next couple of years. Not saying this year or the next year, but in 2024. So, but yeah, I, I, and I like, and I like Baker Mayfield's chance right now, as far as that going to Carolina, Carolina, I, we all knew it was coming, but for, for it to come and for Garoppolo not to get traded three days afterwards. Sorry about that. It's kind of fire go outside my thing. Uh, anyway, anyway, so we, we got through that. So we are going to move on now. From that, uh, Predators are nearing an eight-year, seventy million dollar contract agreement with a uh, Flip Forsberg. So Forsberg right now is on the uh, blocks right now for getting a contract. Uh, Elon Musk terminates his forty-four billion dollar Twitter deal, so he's no longer running Twitter. That's sad news, but that's not the news I wanted to get into today. So this is just upcoming news that was just on my feed as of right now. But this is the one thing I needed to talk about here. The last thing we're going to end with here, and, uh, and I'm going to end the show. Uh, Vince McMahon paid over $12 million for NDAs uh, over the last uh, 16 years to suppress these allegations of sexual misconduct and infidelity. This is also according to the Bleacher Report and the Wall Street Journal. I do, I, I believe I can be able to click on this if I'm not mistaken here. If I can just get the story here. Just get the uh, load of feet here right now. But th- I just had a tick on this whole thing before I even read the article here. For a chairman of an entertainment enterprise such as WWE, and people are, are going to say, why did I cover this again? Why, why does anybody care about this? Because this is the biggest story of the entire week. You know, people are asking me, like, why you cover this? WWE is fake and stuff like that. But this is not a fake story. This is real life crap right now that happened in real life right now from a, from a greedy person who thinks he has the power and all the money in the world. And he can do whatever he wants to do. And here's the funny thing about this whole thing too. That, that he's, and I just thought about this on my drive home tonight. That Stephanie McMahon was forced out of WWE. She stepped away to help take care of her husband who was supposedly uh, dealing with all this stuff. To begin with, here this was the um, okay. This is what the story is. Right now. This is according to I got the article here on NBC News. I was able to pull up in the Wall Street Journal, but it, it's basically the same thing right now. But here's the story right now going forward. To f- but the reality of it is, let me get back to my, I got the story, but let me finish, let me just get to the uh, point here about Stephanie McMahon. So she steps away from this stuff, right? And then, like a week later, or maybe a few days later, actually. This story first comes out and Stephanie becomes chairwoman of the board. Here's my opinion on this whole thing. I'd be surprised if Stephanie exposed this to spite John Laurinaitis because he's one of Vince's people. That's why John Laurinaitis took the, took the thing. Now, of course, Bruce Pitcher was in the taking right now at this point. But he was never known to do any of these allegations. But Michael Dunn... And the history of, of uh, you know, in, between Stephanie Triple H and Michael Dunn and John Lawrence, it's not a pretty history. It's not. It's well known that they don't have a great relationship. They don't. But how ironic is it that John Lawrence was out for the power? He gets exposed, and then Stephanie takes over as chairwoman. Now this this is I'm telling you this right now. This would not surprise me one bit if this was the story. Here, here's what the story is right now. So this is what it says here. This is by David Key Lee. A longtime World Wrestling Entertainment chief, Vince McMahon, paid over $12 million in hush money to four women in hopes of keeping them quiet about possible sexual misconduct, according to Wall Street Journal report on Friday. 
All four women had ties to WWE and their deals came with non-disclosed agreements, barring them from discussing their relationship with a 76-year-old pro wrestling icon, according to the journal. The journal cited legal documents. It has reviewed and in interviews with people familiar with the PACs, which it says stretched back 16 years and involved payouts of $7.5 million, $3 million, and $1 million, around $1 million. MB News has not seen the documents cited or independently verified the agreements. Uh, just three weeks ago, WWE announced that McMahon had stepped back from his leadership responsibilities as the company investigates misconduct claims against them. This doesn't surprise me because all the women have already like said what they needed to say here. And the reality of it is right now, you got people who are going on record right now, not claiming sexual assault, but having creepy conversations with the guy. Go back and watch um, interviews that involve... Um, Oh God, what was the female wrestler's name? I just they just did an interview. Like, I can't think of the name. But she was talking about the time right now about, you know, you know, how they had to dress them in lingerie and stuff. This is a guy that would force women to have pillow fights, mud wrestling matches in this company. Hell, at one point, she put her own daughter in a in a in a in a, in a mud wrestling match. Now, granted, they were still fully clothed at that time, but at that time, well. Now in these day and ages, but it still happened. Hell, you had Stephanie McMahon and Shane McMahon almost have an incest storyline. This man is not, this, this would not surprise me if all this came back and bit this guy in the ass. If these lawsuits get this, I mean, now they can't talk granted about this whole thing, but this actually could hurt Vince McMahon here. The women can't speak at all in this whole thing. But for this to be going on for 16 years, the, the, look, the wife knows about it. This is not news. They've been separated now for a long time. They've been on and off again, separated a long time. It, it, it's not That's not the point. The point is right now is who exposed them. And I thought about it, and it could be Stephanie because she did step away, and then three days later she gets the power back. Oh, so she broke the story. And here's the funny thing. The guy that they were going to probably replace Vince with and take over as chairman got – Benched as well, and nobody trusts Bruce Pritchard, and nobody trusts uh, um, Michael Dunn because they're both dopes, and they're both out of touch with wrestling with today, while Stephanie isn't, and she does all these charity things. And you got Triple H who's coming back with the NXT brand. He was forced out of that whole thing with Vince McMahon. So everything is falling into place. Stephanie runs the day-to-day -day operations as chairwoman of WWE, and you got Triple H who runs NXT again. Leaving Bruce Pritchard to take over talent relations and all the, the, the creative stuff like that. And really, and I think John Laurinaitis is done. There, there's no question about it. There's been more cases now. I've heard Dutch Mantel, who was a former writer for WWE, former employee for WWE, saying how Laurinaitis was more was more behind the scenes, playing with women's emotions, this was basically just really just controlling them in every way, shape, or form. And it got to that point by the fact right now that they, that, that they were, you know, they were treating women in a different kind of breed. They, they were treated differently than anybody else. And it just, you know, but Vince McMahon is not the innocent in this whole thing. But John Lawrence did, did a, I would say, just did it equally bad as what Vince did. Let's just put it that way. I'm talking about this because. It's the most talked about thing right now on ESPN. It's talked about on Fox News. It's talked about on CNN. And I hear, and I've had people tell me, "Oh, this is fake news. WWE, it's entertainment, stuff like that." It's a storyline. This ain't a storyline, okay? If this makes the Wall Street Journal, NBC News, Fox News, CNN reporting, CNN, you know, streaming, which has been dead now for a while, if this would have. If they got their hands on the story. This streaming thing would be continuing today. It doesn't look good for Vince. And he's going to have to step down and let his daughter run the whole shebang for life. Because I know they're keeping quiet, the women, at this point. Why, why does this hurt Vince McMahon now? Because here's the thing. You just called your daughter out. So did the, your buddies, Laura and I, is in, and thing, for how your operation was running into a crap shoe, right? That's what happened, right? We all saw it. And then she steps steps away from the company and walks away from it. Nick Khan also called her out 
um, some stuff. But here's why Nick Khan didn't get the job because he was too stupid to realize there was a there was a uh, a UFC fight going on at T-Mobile. So they had a grant. They got it. So they missed out not only on two venues in the biggest possible spots in Las Vegas, but they had to get the smallest venue in MGM, which is still a great arena for a pay per view show. But you had weeks to look at scheduling and plan events better. And what you do, you fail miserably. You had a guy go on TV, make a commercial break, up, make a commercial about having a uh, having a, a football stadium host a Money in the Bank pay per view. Look how that turned out. That turned out to be a failure. So, and you weren't selling enough tickets even then for that. And then you try to cover it. I mean, they, they did such a horrible job with that. Now, I'm going to tell you this right now. Stephanie McMahon running WWE at this point, as chairwoman to me, ain't such a bad thing. The problem is, though, is I don't think she's running SmackDown as much, which I think it's been mainly Pritchard and Dunn. And whoever else is running SmackDown at this point, because SmackDown has sucked these last two weeks. Been awful shows. They're even worse than Raw. And you have it on a big network like Fox. And Fox is probably looking at their ratings going, why the hell is this bad? And, and 8 o'clock is a primetime hour. So you imagine that's not going to do good for demos and stuff like that. But they've had some bad SmackDowns now these last two weeks. Could be related to Stephanie McMahon running the show or Nick Khan. Nick Khan right now could be running it with with Pritch with Pritchard and them and, and done. And they're probably going at odds because they're not too friendly with the Khan family. They don't know Khan that well. They're just as surprised as how much involved Khan was in before all this stuff. So this could be all Amazon and Peacock people related to the whole thing running the ship bank. And not actually Stephanie and Triple H. Because if, if and this is the same guy they allow to to try to put these shows together, it, you know, I, and I and, and these is, and, and really we just started a UFC event with Pat McAfee sitting at a, at a UFC 276 last weekend, which I didn't even get a chance to cover, by the way. Um, I didn't even watch the fights at all. I couldn't even watch it on pay per view, so I don't even know why I even bother even doing the, the thing the last time I did my podcast on Saturday. But um, <laughs> it's kind of pointless now because I mean. I, I will cover more UFC in the future, but you, you, we all start Vince McMahon, Pat McAfee, Triple H, Stephen McMahon, or I should say Paul Levesque, aka Paul Levesque, and Stephen McMahon setting an event together. Don't you think it's an awkward event right now, knowing what's going on right now, knowing what this woman knows? She's got to take that company from, and, and you know something right now? If it's not even that, if Linda McMahon wants to get back involved, I wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt my ma- mind right now that Stephanie McMahon would want her mom alongside with her to push Vince out the door. Because there's nothing against her. You want to know right now? He, she's the only innocent McMahon person out of the entire family that, that wouldn't screw up the that wouldn't screw up an entertainment uh, enterprise. She ran a whole shebang when, back in the early 2000s with Vince. Look how that turned out. That was great. Ever since she stepped away from it. Yeah, it's been it's been a it's been a very heavy decline. It's been up and down. It was up during the pandemic, surprisingly, but it was mainly down at this point. And by Fox, you know, and, and knowing what's going on at Fox right now, at this point, I would just say right now, and ever since WWE went to Peacock anyway, their pay per views have been have been lacking some kind of like nostalgia here. WrestleMania was great. Backlash, WrestleMania Backlash, great. Hell in a Cell, good, good show. Money in the Bank, pitiful. Very pathetic. And you talk about a very disappointing show, and it got more disappointing as it was getting closer and closer. I think WWE on Peacock right now is not doing anybody any favors. I think having Vince McMahon stepping down at this point from operations that people are looking at it saying, oh, well, I kind of have a feeling like Stephanie McMahon had something to do with her. With Steph- and it wouldn't surprise me. Who's she going to side with her father or side with the mother? You side with the mother in this case. I mean, that, that, that's what you do. You side with that person. You side with the, you don't, you don't follow lead with this whole thing. And Stephanie knew about most of the stuff that was going on. Oh, she was more behind the scenes with her father more than anybody else. Along with Shane, along with Triple H.
Now, the WWE's got to do their own investigation, of course. Let's see how far that goes. But they, and they, they've been good. They've not been good with, with investigating anything. But this looks bad for Vince. More and more of this stuff's coming out. And, 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 and this is going to turn right into a Deshaun Watson scenario. Which, by the way, the which by the way, he almost got a twelve game suspension so far. It may be longer off games. They declined that uh, thing. They're trying to appeal for less games, and they're not going to get it. Vince McMahon might be forced to step down from the chairman position, and Linda McMahon might take back control. I can see where it comes into play here, where the mom who's been away from the wrestling business now for a while, and you could argue right now it's Linda and and and. Uh, Stephanie, because I think people are going to want them more than they're going to want Shane. Because why do they want Shane at this point? Why do they want Nick Khan, a guy who can't even figure out when a UFC pay-per-view is going to happen? Heck, they even tried. They even plead with, with Dana White to give up their venues so they can have their show. Because they, fi they figured out they couldn't sell tickets in Allegiant Stadium for a B-show pay-per-view. Which is no longer even a pay-per-view. I might as well call it a peacock. Come on. Sad. That's what it is. It's absolutely sad of how far this company has fallen, really. And ever since, really, Linda left the uh, run to what uh, left running uh, left really the uh, the operating days to Vince. Now, WWE is starting to go down a, a dark path. I would say probably towards the end of, I would say between, I mean, seventeen they they kind of redeemed themselves. It was twenty. I would say twenty sixteen. With the end of it was bad. Midpoint of it was eh. 2018 was a shit week year. 19 as well wasn't great. 2020 was somewhat better, but 2021, and it really had to do with a three hour show. Now, I think if Linda McMahon was running that thing a long time ago, she would say, hell no to that. In fact, she'd probably go back with one hour on these wrestling shows. Anyway, but that that to me, there's going to be more women in this case. And I know people are going to be asking me the next day, why did I talk about the story again? It's not sports related, but it, it, I mean, it sort of is because this is a, a, a man who also made a deal with ESPN. And they may be removed from the package deal right now that they got going on with ESPN with business wise because you got a chairman right now who's sexually assaulting women. I mean, it's having all sports, but the difference is right now is they're not really branded as the main sports brand. It's choreographed sports right now in a hush hush handshake uh, deal with ESPN and Fox Sports. And if they're trying to go out to CBS Sports, which I know they've been trying to go out there now for a while, which I've been hearing a lot of rumors about that. I don't know. I don't know if they're, they're, if they're really true. They've been confirmed, but I know they've been going out to that. So for this to end up right now, biting this team in the app and, and this whole thing, yeah, it's not going to end well. Anyway, so I'm going to sign off here. This was the 60th episode. I just got to send this really. Just going to send this text message real quickly here. I just had to buy it. I had some missed calls here in the last few minutes. Um. But yeah, uh, anyway, uh, this that's all of it for this week. I actually thought I'd go a little bit longer with the uh, podcast here, honestly, because I had so many sports takes this week. Oh, one thing before I forget, I always did forget about this. Sandra, uh, I think I have her name right here. There is a new team president, first female, African-American female team president. Uh, Sandra Douglas Morgan was hired by the uh, Las Vegas Raiders. So congratulations to her on getting the uh, position. Uh, other than that, uh, Pat McAfee uh, has agreed to a multi-year contract with WWE. Terms not disclosed. Anyway, so that's uh, that's all the news I really have this week. Uh, other than that, that's it. Uh, all our social I did put our social media down in the description below. Uh, it is Ted Williams' 20th anniversary. I don't know why I put down 36th anniversary. Uh, he's been, you know... <laughs> He retired from baseball back in 1960. So if it was a, the 60th, I mean, this might as well have been the 62nd anniversary from his retirement. I might as well just put it out 62nd anniversary from his retirement, his 20th anniversary of uh, celebrating the life and the career of Ted Williams. 
So that was the 20th anniversary this week of when he passed away. And uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, and we'll just fix that in the description. Uh, other than that, you all enjoy the rest of your week. And I will be back here on Tuesday. As of right now, here's the new, st before I really even go here, uh, the new format will be this. Mike will not be here on Tuesday. I will do the show by myself on Tuesday here. And Mike will be here just on Saturdays. With his work schedule and my work schedule, it will be a lot easier if he would be here just on Saturdays. It's tough for now. It Realistically, it is. Uh, it will just be me here on here. In fact, I'm looking for other co-hosts. So if anybody out there is interested in subbing for Mike uh, and you know most about sports and you know a lot of it, come right in. I uh, will we'll have the uh, the thing up there for you. I And I, I apologize again to all hockey fans out there. I wish I had all the names that were posted on here. I was able to read you the first round. I thought I was able to, able to uh, save the uh, – the picture of the Bruins draft because the draft was on Thursday. I think I drafted all the information on Friday. I'm surprised I didn't save on my phone, but uh, unfortunately I didn't get to see, able to save the data. So uh, again, I apologize for that one right now, but if you want to know about the NHL draft and who else got drafted with your respective teams, go ahead, look it up on ESPN, go ahead, look up on NHL.com. Unfortunately I am out of time. Have a great night. Stay well, stay healthy, stay safe out there. And, uh, Go party. It's summer 2022. Don't mess up. Don't let them all get away from you. Bye-bye.